Okay, so now we're going to actually start getting into the different parts of eukaryotic cells and what they do. So, the first cell part um, that we're going to talk about is the cell membrane. And actually, remember, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells both have a cell membrane or a plasma membrane. So, it is composed of a phospholipid bilayer. And technically, you should know what a phospholipid is because we talked about that in our biochemistry chapter, how it has a phosphate group here, and then two fatty acids, which are unsaturated, so they're, they're kind of drawn with the kinks in them, and technically that's connected to a glycerol and two fatty acids and a phosphate. But I told you at that time that when we got into the next chapter, you wouldn't actually see phosphate drawn out and the carbons and the fatty acids or any of that, that they would shorten it up. And so now you see what it looks like. It's sort of a ball with two kind of wavy sticks. So that is the phospholipid bilayer, and it's got proteins in it. You can see in the picture these purple things are the proteins. And we're going to talk in the next chapter about what they do. Um, the heads, which are the phosphates, are hydrophilic. So these, they like water. And the tails are hydrophobic. These are the, the fatty acid chains, so that makes sense that they would not like water. And you'll notice that the heads face outward and the tails face each other. Well, by outward, what I mean is... If you'll notice, here's our phosphates facing outside the cell, and here's our phosphates facing the watery environment inside the cell, and here's all our fatty acids facing each other. And if you were to actually put a bunch of phospholipids into water, they would actually align themselves into a cell membrane. That's exactly what they would do. The, the fatty acids would be attracted to each other, and the phosphates would be attracted to the water, and you'd basically end up with, I'm not going to draw the whole thing, but you'd basically end up with an empty cell. It's called a mycele. You would actually end up with that if you dropped phospholipids in water. They would arrange themselves in that way. So the job of the, of the uh, cell membrane or the phospholipid bilayer is that it is a semi-permeable barrier, meaning it controls what enters and leaves the cell. Be careful because on a test, you know, you could have choices, you know, which thing controls what enters and leaves the cell. One of the options might be cell wall. And that's not going to be your answer. Don't be fooled. Cell walls, remember, we don't even have them in animal cells. They are for protection and support, um, not controlling what enters and leaves. That's the job of the cell membrane. All right, our second cell part is the nucleus. So the nucleus is sort of like the control center because it controls the heredity, meaning all the characteristics of the cell and in a multicellular organism. It also controls cell growth. It determines when that cell will stop getting bigger and it determines when the cell will reproduce, which is very, very important. Um, it has a double membrane around it called the nuclear envelope, and it has little pores in it which can control what enter and leave the nucleus. So just like the cell membrane controls what enters and leaves the cell, the pores control what enter and leave the nucleus. Um, the DNA inside the nucleus, you will not actually see this under the microscope. Um, and it's not because we don't have good enough microscopes to see chromosomes. It's that the DNA, when the cell's not dividing, and remember, it's a code, and it has to be read. So sort of like if you were reading a book, you have to open that book up. So when the DNA um, in a cell that's not dividing, it looks like this. It's like a bunch of strings. And so when you look in the nucleus, you, you, know, you just kind of see a stringy area. You don't actually see uh, the little X-shaped chromosomes. Now, on the flip side of that, um, in order for me to study, I would have to open up my book and maybe even spread out all my notes. And that's what's happening when the cell's not dividing. But when the cell goes to divide, it doesn't want to lose anything, right? It wants to make sure that when it passes on um, the DNA to another cell, nothing gets lost or damaged. So when the cell gets ready to divide, the chromatin, the stringy stuff, coils up really tightly into chromosomes. So these long strings literally super coil into those X-shaped things that you may remember seeing when you learned about mitosis or meiosis. So when you were drawing those X's, those chromosomes, yes, that is a chromosome and that is the DNA, but technically that only, it only forms that shape when the cell's dividing, and when the cell's not dividing, it looks like this stringy mass. Also in the nucleus is a dark area called the nucleolus, um, so here's your cell, here's the nucleus, and in there, the nucleolus. Keep in mind that the nucleolus does not have a membrane around it. This is sort of a misconception. You know, when you draw it, it looks almost like it's like another little membrane-bound thing in the nucleus. It's not. It's just a dark area, 
And what it does is it makes rRNA, and the R in rRNA stands for ribosomal. So this is basically ribosomal RNA, or it's what the ribosomes are made of. So the nucleolus is basically assembling the parts that are going to compose the ribosomes, which is actually going to be the next part we're going to talk about. All right, here's a picture on the left of a nucleus under a scanning electron microscope. Notice that 3D image looks almost like the moon or something. And then here at the bottom left, you see the pores under a transmission electron microscope, and you can actually see what they, what they look like. Um, you'll also notice in this picture over here, here's our nucleus, double membrane, and notice how it is actually connected to this, which is going to, this is the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, but notice how they're connected, and I'll come back to that. Okay, ribosomes. So ribosomes are little particles. You probably remember them looking like dots, and they're made of two things, rRNA and protein. Remember that the rRNA, this was made by the nucleolus, so there's a relationship there between the nucleolus and the making of ribosomes. It actually, uh, a ribosome is actually made of two pieces. One's actually called the large subunit and one's called the small subunit. They do have other names. I think it's like, I want to say like an 80S unit and the 30S unit. Um, I know bacteria have different names for them because their ribosomes are different. You don't have to know that though. If you just know that they're made of two pieces, a big one and a small one, that's fine. You actually see ribosomes in two places. In a cell, you might see little dots free floating. Those are actually called free ribosomes. And although all ribosomes make protein, that is their job, the free ribosomes make proteins for the cell itself. On the other hand, bound ribosomes are literally bound to or stuck to the endoplasmic reticulum, making it rough, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And those ribosomes make proteins that are going to get modified and packaged and exported from the cell. So they, their jobs, although both make proteins, free ribosomes make proteins for inside the cell, and bound ribosomes make proteins that will be exported from the cell. For example, in, particularly in multicellular organisms, enzymes and hormones, uh, a lot of those kinds of proteins are made in one area and then excreted um, and sent to another area. And so the ribosomes would be making those proteins for export. Okay. Now, all of these um, organelles, the nuclear envelope, the ER, Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, vacuoles, and the cell membrane are part of what's called the endomembrane system. And the reason they're called that is because literally pieces of each one of these, they're all made of membrane. That's exactly like the cell membrane. And pieces of each of these can break off and become part of other things. Uh, and I'll show you this in a couple of minutes, but remember how I showed you a moment ago how the nucleus, the nuclear membrane was literally attached to the rough ER. And what you're going to see is when the rough ER makes a protein, or it modifies a protein, which is what it does, a piece of that rough ER can literally bubble off and form what's called a vesicle and carry that protein product to the next place, the Golgi bodies, which look kind of like stacks here, and that piece of membrane that started here can end up fusing here. And now another piece can break off here and carry the product that was made to the cell membrane where it literally fuses and now this becomes part of the cell membrane. And so pieces of membrane literally break off and get attached to other areas. And that's why this is called the endomembrane system because this, these are the ones that are involved in it. Okay, so the first part of the endomembrane system is the endoplasmic reticulum, or you may remember it being called the ER. So the ER is literally attached to the nuclear envelope. It, it's continuous, the nucleus sort of ends, and the endoplasmic reticulum begins. There are two kinds of endoplasmic reticulum. The rough is easy to recognize because it's bumpy, it literally has ribosomes on it, and the smooth looks smooth. It does not have ribosomes on it. This is a picture under a transmission electron microscope, and this is rough endoplasmic reticulum. I can tell because I can see the red dots are the ribosomes, and the yellow is the endoplasmic reticulum. Smooth would look very similar, but without the ribosomes. Here's another picture, again on the left, showing how the nucleus is literally attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and they are also showing on the left side of the picture a little bit of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. 
And this is under an electron microscope. You can see on this side, this is rough. You can see all these dots, the ribosomes here. And notice no dots on the left side. All right. Now, their jobs are very different also. The smooth ER focuses on lipids. Uh, it does a couple of other things too, but it's where lipids are, are manufactured, so triglycerides, things like that, and steroids like aldosterone and uh, testosterone, um, estrogen. All of the hormones that are steroids, they're made by smooth ER. Um, another thing that it does is it converts glycogen to glucose in the liver. You may remember from biochemistry chapter, glyc glycogen was how we stored our energy between meals in muscles and in the liver. Um, and then as we need it, we just break off little glucose molecules from it, and the glucose can be used independently. Um, another thing, very important, this is the detoxification site for drugs. So even if you just take, for example, Tylenol or antibiotics or whatever, basically anything you eat, uh, as soon as it gets digested and it goes to the small intestine, when it gets absorbed into the bloodstream, the very first stop is the liver. And your liver starts uh, filtering out and breaking down anything that, you, any chemicals. And um, it does take time to do that. If it could break it all down right away, then antibiotics wouldn't work because you'd take them and they would immediately get broken down. Um, but you will see half-lives um, on medications that'll say how long they stay in your system and it's based on, in part at least, how quickly the liver detoxifies different things. So that's the smooth ER. Now the rough ER, everything it does has to do with proteins, which makes sense because remember, it's surrounded by ribosomes which make protein. So it finishes assembling, folding proteins. It also makes what are called glycoproteins, which are proteins that have sugar groups attached to them. And you'll hear more about them um, in particular in the next chapter. Quaternary structures are, um, are, are also put together here. And then vesicles will break off of the rough ER. A vesicle is just a little ball. And, and carry the finished products to other locations in the cell. Um, Golgi apparatus. Sometimes you'll hear it called Golgi complex or Golgi bodies. It's all the same. You just remember the Golgi part or Golgi part. Um, those three words, Golgi body, Golgi complex, Golgi apparatus, it really depends what book you look at. Um, these are flattened sacs. It actually looks like a stack of little short sacs, like pancakes. What does it do? It modifies the products of the endoplasmic reticulum, and it packages it for export. So the Golgi apparatus is super important because the ER modified a protein, sends it to the Golgi, the Golgi packs it up, and then it sends it to the cell membrane where it can get exported. Um, the cis side is the side where stuff comes in. It gets modified. And then the trans side is where the stuff comes out the other side. I doubt they would ask you this on an AP exam, which is one of the reasons I have it in red. It was just sort of a little tidbit. I don't know that it's that important to know. Here's a diagram of the Golgi bodies under a microscope and then sort of a sketch, and you notice how it's a little stack of, a little stack of sacs. Um, and this is a really nice picture showing that relationship in the endomembrane system that I mentioned. Notice how you could have a piece of rough ER break off. This is a vesicle. It carries the product to the Golgi where it gets modified, and all of these breaking off, these are vesicles that are now sending that product, for example here, to the cell membrane. And now this piece of membrane that was vesicle will now be part of the cell membrane. So that's why this is all part of the endomembrane system. All right, lysosomes are specifically sacs of enzymes. Lysosomes digest things. Um, now all cells have them, but in some cases, particularly in like microscopic organisms, that this may be where they digest their food. It can be like their stomach. They hydrolyze or break down proteins, lipids, polysaccharides, and nucleic acids. Basically everything. Everything gets broken down here into its individual units. Now, technically, we have a digestive system that breaks down most of our stuff, but there are two specific things that lysosomes in our body would do. One is called phagocytosis. This is when a cell eats other cells. A really good example of this would be your white blood cells. White blood cells literally eat and destroy bacteria. And where would they do the digesting of that? In the lysosomes. And autophagy, this is where cells basically digest themselves. They actually break down organelles that are all worn out. 
uh, and this is something else that lysosomes would do. So make sure you know both of these, phagocytosis and autophagy.